Good morning. You take your copy of God's Word and open it to Matthew chapter 5. We started last week a new sermon series uh, called the Beatitudes. Many of you are familiar with that. It's the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. There are eight blessings or eight Beatitudes that we'll be looking at one at a time over the next several weeks together. So I want to read it to you uh, this morning, the first 12 verses, and then we're going to pray together. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God, we pray this morning as we look at your word over the next few moments together. God, we pray that your spirit would go before us. God, we pray for anyone in this room who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. God, we pray today will be the day of salvation. And for many others that are hurting, God, we pray that they would be comforted this morning through your living word. God, for others who might be proud, thinking that they don't really even need to be here, God, we pray for a contrite heart. God, we pray for brokenness. Lord, do whatever you need to do to draw us to the side of your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. About 15 years ago, I was uh, serving as an associate pastor at a church called First Baptist Leesburg. Uh, One of my best friends in the ministry, Cliff Lee, is still the pastor there. I worked for him. He had just gotten there. And uh, at the time, he was kind of, the the church was a bit of limbo on services and different things like that. And uh, he was kind of not wanting to preach on Sunday night. It wasn't something that he had done before. And so I was kind of the young guy, and he said, hey, you preach on Sunday night. And so I did a really good job and about killed it myself, you know, preaching bad sermons. But I would show up and preach, and we moved it eventually to the men's residence chapel. Now, at first, Leesburg, they have a men's residence. They have a lot of ministries there, but the men's residence is a very special ministry to me. A lot of my dear friends have been through that uh, ministry. They've been called into the gospel ministry. Some of them are serving as pastors and DOMs across the Southern Baptist Convention. And I preached a lot of my very first sermons on a regular basis in that place. And there was a church down the road, First Baptist Bushnell, that was interested in me. My name had been given to them. And so they called one day and said, hey, we're going to send a search team to hear you preach. And so I was like, well, okay, but probably what you need to know is that I preach in a really odd place. Uh, When you show up, it's not going to look or feel like a normal Baptist church probably would feel. Um, When you get there, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb because when you get there, all I see is a sea of tattoos, and I'm not talking about like I heart my mom, you know what I mean? Like these are, these are you know, <laughs> war wounds of the past. These are some, some, some very scary types, types of situations. And when you get there, you're going to stick out, but that's okay. I love it. I love preaching there. I love those brothers. They're dear friends of mine. And so they came. They stuck out like a sore thumb, and I preached, and uh, eventually they called me back and wanted to talk a little bit more. And one of the brothers on that team, he said, he said, hey, listen, it was really strange listening to you preach in that environment. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, the people were kind of rambunctious and loud, and they said amen a lot, and they were clapping their hands and all kinds of things. I said, well, that's very normal there, but to be honest with you, I kind of hope that if I come here, that the people of this church will be just as glad to hear the name of Jesus Christ as those brothers are. And the reason that they were glad in that place is because those brothers had been forgiven much. They hadn't lost the awe of what it means to come into relationship with Jesus Christ and to be forgiven of your sin and released from the bondage of drug addiction and all types of other things. They were happy to be there. They were happy to sit under the word of God. You know, the Bible tells us that there is a gladness 
a gladness and a joy that is pervasive amongst God's people when we are drawing near to him, when we are reminded of our sinfulness in the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Amen? One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is tethered to a psalm in the Psalter. It's one of my favorite psalms. And in Psalm 34, verse 18, it says these words. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. I love that psalm because I love the story that's tethered to it. We're not exactly sure if King David wrote that psalm in the cave, or perhaps he just sung the song to the 400 men that gathered in the cave with him. But we do know in the story something really interesting happened. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, David is on the run again. King Saul, David is not yet quite king, but he's been anointed by God to be king. King Saul wants to kill David. He's enraged with jealousy. He's tried a couple of times before, and he's not going to fail this time. He's going to kill David. So David's on the run. And David goes to a place to seek refuge. And the place he goes is to a place not far outside of Jerusalem where he meets with a prince or a priest, and that priest's name is Ahimelech. When he gets there to Ahimelech, he is going to seek counsel. He's going to seek refuge. But Ahimelech, if you read 1 Samuel 21, kind of begins to figure out that something is not quite right. So he begins to ask David questions. Where are your soldiers? David had been entrusted with many soldiers. Where are they at? And David begins to kind of tell all kinds of lies. He says, well, I'm actually on a mission from King Saul, and my men are all near. They're just kind of hiding. We need some food, and so he gives them the bread from the altar that was about to be changed out anyway. And David continues to tell his lies, and he's like, well, since I'm on this secret mission from King Saul, I need a weapon. And the priest, of course, didn't have any weapon, but he did have one very important thing. He had the sword that cut off the head of Goliath. David's pretty familiar with this sword. He's like, well, that'll work. That's a good sword. And so he goes and he gets the sword, and he knows he has to leave Elimelech. And he goes down to a place called Gath. Gath is kind of the headquarters of the Philistine camp. And the Bible tells us when he goes there, he meets with King Achish. King Achish realizes very quickly that I can't give refuge to the man who killed our greatest warrior. And so David did what most men do on a regular basis. He started acting like a lunatic. He goes down to the city gate. He begins to claw it up. He begins to slobber all over himself. And eventually the king says, man, this guy's a fruit loop. Like, let's just kick him out of the city. We don't need to kill him. He's, he's crazy. He's lost his mind. I, I've actually been tempted in a few deacons meetings in the past to do such a thing, right? <laughs> like when it gets tough, you know, just that crazy. And so he, he leaves. He leaves and he goes to a very special place, the cave of Adullam. It's in that cave, the cave of Adullam, that David either writes Psalm 34 or he sings Psalm 34 to the 400 men who come to console and to minister to David. And in that cave, as David comes to his senses after all types of lies and showing out, he says these words, God is near to the brokenhearted. And he saves the crushed in spirit. I love that story because David, for a while, tried to do it all himself. But it wasn't until he was broken that he had an encounter with the living God of heaven. He says in verse 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. In verse 19, he says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. The whole psalm is just rich with God's comfort. And all throughout the pages of the Old Testament, we are introduced to a God who comforts the brokenhearted. Right in the outside of the garden, in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, we are met 
with a man and a woman who have rebelled against God and been kicked out of a perfect garden, a perfect environment where the glory of God was present. And it's who that meets them there? I believe it's the the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ who performs a sacrifice and covers them with animal cloth in their brokenness, in their shame, signifying imputed righteousness that was still to come. We fast forward in the Old Testament and we're introduced to men like Abraham who in his brokenness he can't conceive with his wife and yet God meets him and promises him and makes the Abrahamic covenant with him and he gives him a son. We're introduced to people like Moses who the book of Numbers told us because of his spiritual depression and having to deal with a bunch of rebellious people wanted to just die. And yet God meets with him and ministered to him in his brokenness. We're met with people like Elijah, who after a mountaintop experience, finds himself at a brook. And it's God who comforts him there. We're met by a woman by the name of Ruth, who is a widow from Moab, the trash can of the world at the time. And God in his providence provides and meets with her by giving her a kinsman redeemer. Time doesn't do justice to speak of Job and Jonah and many other saints in the Old Testament that God comforted in their brokenness. And here in the text, as Jesus begins to pronounce the coming kingdom of God, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He talks to the people and he tells them in the midst of their brokenness, and there are broken people all over that Galilean hillside, he tells them in their brokenness, blessed are those who are broken, who are mourning, who are struggling, for you will be comforted. We all know what mourning is, don't we? There's all types of different mourning. We know of mourning over personal sorrow. Just this week, one of our beloved deacons passed away, Jim Fair. He hasn't been able to attend church in about a year. And he would call my office every week to encourage me and to tell me how much he loved me and how much he enjoyed the sermon. He couldn't even use the internet. He would use the phone and he would call in and we have this little thing where you can call in and listen to the sermon on the phone. And he would sit there late at night and he would listen to the sermon because he said he didn't want any distractions. And he passed away. And my heart hurt when I found out about it. But the reality is, in that moment, Jim Fair was in the presence of his Savior. We all know what mourning over personal sorrow is. There are a lot of people in this room that are broken for a lot of reasons. Life hasn't been good. I prayed with a young family just outside just a couple of minutes ago whose daughter has a heart condition. She's about three months old. They're not sure what's going to happen. There's all types of sorrow in this room and all types of heartache. There's all types of caves that some of us are living in. We also know the mourning over sorrow in this world. We look at the news. We look all around us. There is brokenness everywhere. And we think to ourselves, could it get any worse? But God is sovereign. He's in control. But we know what it feels like. But the deepest type of sorrow is the sorrow of sin because it is sin that brings about worldly hurt and worldly pain. It's sin that introduces us to death and the fact that we have to walk through that together. Sin is the foundation for all of the brokenness in the world, and we know that. And what Jesus is getting at in this text, which is an outflow of verse 3, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt... For theirs is the kingdom of God. He is telling us in verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. In other words, not only are you mourning over all types of different brokenness, but primarily you are mourning over your sin. For you will be comforted. I want us to look at the text. I just want to make three brief observations, three very brief observations, a very simple verse, but three brief observations to help us this morning. And draw us to a response. The first is in the form of a question, and it is this. Do you ever mourn over your sin? Do I ever grieve over my own personal sin? 
In verse 3, as Jesus introduces the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, or the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In other words, that you and I come to a place when we come to faith in Jesus Christ that we realize that we bring nothing to the table. It's all because of the grace and the mercy of God that we can enter into relationship with him through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? We are spiritually bankrupt, as it tells us, and some scholars write, that that this is not a poor, like, you need to work harder because you don't have enough money or resources. This is a poor, like, you can never pay back the debt. You are bankrupt. And yet God introduces people who come to him as spiritually bankrupt individuals, understanding they bring nothing to the table. He introduces us to the one, Jesus Christ, who brings it all to the table, the epitome of righteousness, the sinless son of God. We are justified and forgiven when we come into relationship with him. And so here in the text, the Bible reminds us as Jesus is preaching the sermon, the very first part of a three-chapter sermon as we have in our Bible, he is introducing us to the reality that those who continue to understand their sinfulness in light of a holy God, they are the ones who God continually comforts. They are the ones who understand they need to be dependent on God, and he continues to grab us, and he continues to bring us in. God is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. When was the last time you were broken over your sin? When was the last time you were grieved over your sin? There have been certainly many large moments in my life where I was just broken beyond belief. I I, I remember my very first time I went to Israel many years ago. I was asked to go by another pastor I had never been before. And he asked me, I guess a good way to break a young pastor in, he's like, hey, you're going to lead the devotion in the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Until I got there. <laughs> and then I got there, and I had my nice little alliterated outline and all that stuff, you know. And I got there, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God just pressed upon me in a way that I'm not sure I've ever felt. And I recognize that my Savior sweat blood in this garden because he was about to take all of Aaron Bergner's sin and place it on his sinless self. We, we, make, we, make, we talk about sin in such generic ways. We talk about sin as if it's just some, some like kind of just big problem. It's a problem that we individually have. Jesus took my sin to the cross, my thoughts, The things that I've said, the ways that I've rebelled against God, Jesus took that to the cross. And I was sitting there, and I was just overwhelmed by the goodness and the grace of God that he would take my sin to the cross. And then we walked just a little bit farther and went to the house of Caiaphas, and we went down into the pit where they held Jesus for about three or four hours that night. And we read Psalm 88, where Jesus is crying out that he's in the pit, and there is no help for him. And I was reminded in that little tight room with all those people how Jesus willingly did this for me. And then we marched to Golgotha, and it was there at Golgotha where I realized that Jesus hung on a cross, willingly hung on a cross. He wasn't forced there. He willingly went to the cross for my sin. But then we walked a few yards to an empty tomb, and praise God, it's empty. And I was reminded in that moment of the weight of my sin and the magnitude of God's grace and his comfort. Jesus tells us this. This is the heart of the Christian message. This is the heart of the gospel message. In Luke 4, verses 18 through 19, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. Listen to what he says. To preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoner, to recover the sight of the blind, to release the oppressed. Do you hear what he says? To preach good news, to proclaim freedom, to release the oppressed, to recover sight. Jesus came to bring comfort and peace and contentment and joy to all those who will come to him in brokenness. When was the last time you grieved over your sin and recognized how beautiful the gospel of Jesus Christ is? 
Matthew to this point in the first four chapters is painting a picture with the parallel story of Moses of a new exodus has come. Jesus says in verse 17 of chapter 4, repent, the kingdom of God is near. It is evident what is happening in the text. And then all of a sudden in chapter 5, he begins to preach this sermon that makes no worldly sense whatsoever. The world says, blessed are the proud, for theirs is the world. Blessed are not those who mourn, but those who taunt others. They judge others. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. We're reminded in Luke 18, which you'll hear me refer to over and over and over in this study, of the Pharisee and the tax collector who went to the temple. You remember the story? The Bible opens by telling us in that parable that the Pharisee went there to justify his righteousness. He said, oh God, I, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Has anybody ever prayed that before? Sure you have. You've thought it. God, I, I thank you that I'm not like the folks walking down the street on Memorial Boulevard. God, I thank you that I'm not like these people over there who are in terrible shape. There's a difference in gratitude for God's blessings and thinking that you're entitled or you're better than someone else. This is the Pharisee. God, I thank you that I'm better than all these other people. But then the tax collector over in the corner, what did he say? He said in verse 13, standing far off, he would not even lift up his head, but he beat his chest and said, Oh God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. Now you might say at first glance, that sounds kind of sad, doesn't it? What is sad? Except for the fact the Bible says that he left justified. It was in his brokenness that he drew near to God and he was justified. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Until we get to a place where we recognize our standing before God, that our sin offends the holy character of God, and it's by the grace of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ that we are saved. Until we get to that point, we will not experience the nearness of God that he intends us to experience. Let me make a second observation. It's pretty simple, too. Because he said, blessed are those who mourn. By the way, the word blessed, makeros in the Greek, it means positionally. Not like happy, happy, but positionally. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Did you know it's an emphatic promise in the New Testament? And the Old Testament speaks of it over and over and over again, that those who who will come to Jesus Christ will. He will never turn anyone away. Anyone. He will never turn anyone away. Listen to me say that. Those who come to Jesus Christ in believing faith, in brokenness over their sin, in repentance, he will comfort you. In other words, Christ gives comfort to those who come broken to him. Did you know that? Comfort is promised all throughout the New Testament for those who come to Christ. Take my yoke, my non-yoke upon you. Take my non-burden, my non-burden. It's light. Jesus gives rest to the weary. He gives a drink to the thirsty. Jesus Christ brings comfort to those who are broken. Reflect on the gospel with me for just a moment. Let me just make more observations from the gospel message. It's a very simple truth that we're all familiar with, but we must remind ourselves daily. The first way in which the gospel brings great comfort is the reality that you and I have been delivered from the penalty of sin. Did you know that? That when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, and you believe on him, and he saves you, that you and I are, 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 are relieved and we're delivered from the penalty of sin, which is death. Did you know that? That's all of our biggest problems. You may think you have some big problems right now, but your biggest problem is eternity. Your biggest problem is that you are separated from God, and unless you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you will not see his face. You will eternally die. The first level of comfort is the fact that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, he instantly delivers us from 
sin's penalty, which is eternal death. But a second way in which we are comforted in the gospel of Jesus Christ is that as we gaze on the cross in the empty tomb, we recognize God's deep, perfect love for us. Jesus is preaching this sermon. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. But what they could not quite fully see yet, what the Old Testament saints could not quite fully see yet, is they couldn't quite see the cross, and they certainly hadn't seen the empty tomb. But you and I sit here 2,000 years later, and we look back at the cross, and we look back at the empty tomb, and we realize God's deep, abiding, perfect love for his children. Is that not beautiful? The Bible tells us, as Jesus preached in John 3, 16, it's probably the first verse you memorize as a child, for God so what? Loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. But even before he preached that message, One of my favorite stories in the New Testament is a story about shepherds. And the Bible says that the shepherds, those stinky shepherds, were out in a field and they were tending to their sheep. And you remember the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. The heavens opened up and the angel proclaimed, don't be afraid. I bring you good news or the gospel of great joy. And it will be for all people, even stinky shepherds. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, here it is, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Did you know that? The gospel pronounces God's great love for us. We live in a loveless world, don't we? Everything's vying for your attention. Satan would love nothing more than to steal everything in your life to still kill and destroy. But God sends his own son into space and time and he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. The gospel reminds us of God's great love for us. The gospel also reminds us and gives us comfort through the Holy Spirit that we have been delivered from the power and the bondage of sin. The apostle Paul is so enthralled by this truth and he wants the church to know that he spends three chapters in Romans 6 through 8 writing about the fact that we are no longer enslaved to sin but we are free in the spirit of God. Do we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Sin has been put to death in the tomb with Jesus Christ and you and I walk in freedom under the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 tell us that upon conversion, you and I are sealed with the Holy Spirit, that we receive the Holy Spirit upon conversion. Did you know that? That God holds us until the day of redemption. Yes, in this life, you and I will still continue to commit sins. Yes, we will still mess up and offend the character of, or offend the holy nature of God. But we can come to him in repentance knowing that he loves us and he holds us until the day of redemption. The gospel reminds us through the Holy Spirit that we have comfort through the Holy Spirit. We also know forth and finally... That we have comfort in the gospel in the fact that one day, one day, Jesus Christ will return and remove all sin and all of its effects forever and ever and ever. I'm pretty jacked about that one. I mean, think about that. Think about the fact that one day, and we believe in the imminent return of Christ, that Christ can come back and will come back at any moment. The Apostle Paul is so enthralled with it, he writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now, and not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. It was the Apostle's hope. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, the apostle Peter, in the midst of a great persecution, said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has caused us to be born again to what? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Old John on Patmos. 
He's suffering much. There's a lot of sorrow in his life. The heavens are pulled back. And he's comforted by the Savior who reminds him that one day all pain and sickness, all heartache, and even death will pass away. Behold, I will make all things new. I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what sorrow you're dealing with. I don't know what pain you're going through. I don't know what your struggle is in this life, but God knows. And I do do know this. That Jesus tells us and the gospel pronounces to us that those who mourn will be comforted. Those who come to him in believing faith will be received. You will be comforted. God will give you peace. Which brings us to a final observation. And this is a question that we ask ourselves every day, isn't it? Will I choose to be satisfied in Christ today? Will I choose to be satisfied in Christ today? Many people, even in this room, and certainly people in the world, will choose every day of their life to be happy in their sin. But the result, I hate to tell you this, the result will be great sorrow. And many people pick that every day. I'd rather be happy in my sin. I like my sin too much. I like my life too much. I like my stuff too much. But I'm telling you, great sorrow is the end. But brothers and sisters, just know this, according to the counsel of the word of God, according to the words of Jesus himself, those who are sorrowful over their sin and will come to him in brokenness, you will not find more sorrow, you will find happiness in the presence of God. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Did you know that? I was coming in early this morning and I was listening to the radio, and uh, someone saying, it is well with my soul. I love that hymn. It is well with my soul. Reminded me of the story. Many of you may know the story, but if you don't, let me just tell it. Horatio Spafford wrote that hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Horatio Spafford was a man who, by American standards, had hit the jackpot. He was an attorney. In the late 1800s, he was an attorney and he was a real estate investor and he owned several hotels. But many of you might remember from history in 1871, he lived in Chicago, something catastrophic happened, the great Chicago fire. It took everything that Horatio Spafford owned. All he had left was his family. But not long after that fire, Scarlet fever started running rampant through the United States. And Horatio Spafford's four-year-old little boy died. He didn't really know what to do. He was crushed and heartbroken. I can't even imagine. And so he decided to send his wife, Anna, and his four remaining daughters overseas to Europe. On their way over to Europe, The ship hit something and 200 people died. All four of his girls. Anna, his wife, was the only one that survived. Anna was rescued and taken on and she sent a telegraph back to her husband in Chicago. And here's here's her words. All is lost. What do I do? Have you ever said that? Have you ever felt that? All is lost. What do I do? Horatio didn't know what to do, so he got on a boat. He was going to to be with his wife to comfort her. And as he was heading across the ocean, the ship captain believed it might bring some comfort to him. And so he brought Horatio to the bow of the boat, and he said, Listen, we're passing over right now where your daughters are laying at the bottom of the ocean. He went back to his cabin And he took out a letterhead of one of his hotels. I have a copy of it in my office. And he wrote, It is well with my soul. Many of us in this room right now are in a cave. (laughs) 
Maybe you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe you're crossing over the sea and it looks like there is no hope underneath you. But brothers and sisters, if you will draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be able to exclaim while it may hurt on the outside, it is well with my soul. Jesus preached to those broken people on that Galilean hillside. He said, listen, brothers and sisters, I know you came perhaps for a meal or you came for more of your sickness or your diseases to be healed. And those are good things to want. But what you need to know is blessed are those who are broken. Blessed are those who mourn because when you draw to me, you will be comforted. And so maybe you're here this morning. And you've been trying to find comfort in this life. Brothers and sisters, I, I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, the only comfort you will ever find is in the Lord Jesus Christ. You might find it temporarily in other things, but eternally speaking, you will not find any greater comfort any greater satisfaction, any greater joy than a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us if you repent of your sin and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, he will save you. Come to him in believing faith and you will be saved. This morning should be the day of salvation for you. Come this morning. Talk to one of our pastors. Cry out to Jesus Christ. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And maybe for many others in this room, you feel like you're in a cave or you're crossing the sea or you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Cling to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord saves the crushed in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God, I pray right now in this moment as we sing this song, God, I pray that we would respond to you. God, we thank you for the great hope that you give us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that while all of us are sinners and we all fall short of your glory, we thank you that you provided a way, provision, through the blood atonement of your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that today would be the day of salvation, that someone would come this morning and be saved. For many others in this room, Lord, I pray that we would not waste this moment, but that we would be willing to get on our face before you in the midst of our valley, in the midst of our hurt, and cling to you. Lord, I pray as a church that brothers and sisters in Christ would pray over each other, bring comfort to each other, knowing that the body of Christ was left to be a picture of the kingdom of God. To propagate the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that the body would function the way you designed the body to function and we would bring comfort and peace to those who are grieving. But, Lord, ultimately we know that our comfort and peace comes through you and your son. So, Lord, comfort your people this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing the song of invitation together?